Portions of the following video can be viewed in 3D. When the boy puts on his special glasses, put on yours. Make sure that the dark lens covers your right eye. Now, I'd like you to stay in your groups all day. Make sure you stick together and don't lose each other. We'll all meet together for lunch in the assembly area, and then I'll tell you where and when we're going to meet to go home. Pat, you listening? So, make sure you've got a pencil or a pen with you. And when we finish this afternoon, give me back your activity sheets and your notes. Anyone have a problem with that? Anyone need to borrow a pen? No? Nope. Don't run about, don't shout or yell at each other. Remember, there's other visitors here who want to enjoy themselves as well. Right, we'll start by visiting the statue of the man who organized the museum when it first opened. And you've got some work to do on your activity sheets. Then it's up to you to make notes like we talked about in class yesterday. Now this is a statue of Professor Sir Richard Owen, who organized the museum when it first opened in 1888. It took about 20 years to build this part of the building, which had been designed specially to hold the natural history specimens in the British National Collection. Right, we'll go and see the Diplodocus skeleton, then we'll go into the exhibition, and in there you'll see lots of Down, young fella. No, 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 there, it's all right. There's nothing to harm you here. Who are you? Where is this? How did no, I... No, no, one question at a time. I am Professor Sir Richard Owen, and this, dear boy, is the Natural History Museum. The Natural History Museum? I was supposed to come here in my class tomorrow. Do you live here? Oh, I wouldn't say live. More that I've been around here for a long time. Then you must know about dinosaurs. That is a fair assumption. Have you ever seen a dinosaur? You mean like Fred Flintstone? You know about the Flintstones, then? Well, I told you I'd been around, but nobody, not even a real Fred Flintstone, has seen a dinosaur. See this? This giant beast. Suppose it represented the entire history of our planet, the Earth. It came into being right here, at the nose. Now, halfway down the neck, about the eighth cervical vertebra, life began. Now, all through this big fat, ribby area, life existed as squishy things in the ocean. It was only here at the base of the tail that we find creatures with backbones. You mean like fish? 
guess, uh, like fish. And only halfway down the tail that we find the walking on dry land. Yes, but what about the dinosaurs? No, no, patience, my boy. The dinosaurs only appeared at this thin curve near the end of the tail, and humans, modern man, well, only that very last small bone at the end of this enormous beast represents them. Or perhaps I should say us. Yes, but why can people see dinosaurs? 65 million years, that's why. This thin curve is 65 million years. The last dinosaur died out 65 million years before the first human was even born. I wish I could see a dinosaur. <laughs> Professor? 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 I'm up here, dear boy. How did you get up there? Shut your eyes and then open them. How did you do that? <laughs> it was nothing, my lad. Here, put these glasses on and take a peek at our giant friend down below. Make sure the dark lens covers your right eye. You might have heard of its cousin, Brontosaurus, Thunder Lizard. Thunder Lizard. When it walked by, it must have sounded like thunder. It's now called a Patosaurus. How do its legs hold it up? It does have to swim. People used to think that giant animals, like whales today, had to live in water. But now we know that Diplodocus' legs were indeed strong enough to carry it about quite comfortably. Just take a look at those legs. Notice how they're tucked under the body. They support it like pillars. That's one of the signs of a dinosaur. Now watch. Wow, what's that? That's an animal living today in your time, a reptile called an iguana. Notice how its legs stick out at the sides of its body. This lizard is a gecko, a leopard gecko. And its legs stick out at the side too. Which means they are not dinosaurs. But look at Diplodocus. His legs are tucked right underneath his body, like all dinosaurs. Wow, look at him. That's Tyrannosaurus Rex, isn't it? No. It's his close relative, Allosaurus. Even though he walks on two legs and is very different from Diplodocus, the legs are still tucked under, which tells us that he is a dinosaur. Hey, look, a flying dinosaur. Magnificent, isn't it? Those wings are six meters across, greater than any bird now flying. It's also a reptile, and it even lived at the same time as dinosaurs, but it's not a dinosaur. Why not? Because no dinosaur could fly, and no dinosaur ever lived in the sea. They all lived on land. They all died out. Yes, but for many millions of years longer than humans, they dominated every corner of land on this planet. Triceratops and Edmontosaurus here both hailed from the western part of North America. Even Antarctica was a home for dinosaurs. It wasn't always covered by ice. We scientists divide the reign of the dinosaurs into three sections. They first appear about 228 million years ago in what we call the Triassic period. Allosaurus here lived, oh, about 145 million years ago in the time known as the Jurassic period. You might have heard of that one.
that's Triceratops. Good. Just look at those horns. When did it live? I see you appreciate a fine dinosaur, young man. Magnificent is the word. Triceratops means three-horned face. An apt description. It lived near the end of the age of the dinosaurs, in what is called the Cretaceous period, which ended about 65 million years ago. Then, poof! Perth? The dinosaurs disappeared. You can take your glasses off now. Meet our friend Triceratops as he is today. Gosh, he's big! And those horns, flipping heck, he must be terribly fierce. Surprisingly, he ate nothing but vegetation. The giant beak was for snipping plants off the ground, and those teeth for chopping plants into a mush. I don't think this fellow went around looking for trouble. The horns were used only for defence. Are these bones real? The short answer is no, but they are cast from the fossils of the bones. What does that mean, then? Shut your eyes. That's Baryonyx. This dinosaur lives some time after Diplodocus at the beginning of the Cretaceous period. Does its mouth remind you of anything? Hmm. Sort of like a crocodile's. I thought you were a bright lad. Now, where's that picture? Oh, yes. Here. This shows Baryonyx. Shopping for lunch. Well, yes. Notice those claws. They were the first part of the beast to be found. Indeed, baryonyx means heavy claw. Looks good for catching fish. Some dinosaurs ate fish. Fish appeared long before dinosaurs and survived long after, too. Hey, there's a turtle. Oh, yes. The first turtle appeared just before the first dinosaurs. This wetland or swamp, you see, believe it or not, covered the south of England. England? Yes! Now, Baryonyx's crocodile-like mouth was perfect for catching fish. It died on a sandbank next to a river. And so? The flesh of bit through his body would have been eaten or rot away. Leaving? Just bones. And? Teeth. Yes! And then? The bones would be buried underground. For ages and ages and ages. And while underground, the bones would change to rock. Rock? Exactly the same shape as the original bones. Called? Fossils. Of course, these bones are not from Baryonyx, but from another dinosaur, Edmontosaurus, that you have already seen. Perhaps someday I could find a dinosaur. Professor? 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 Ah, found me then. I thought you would. Well, Tens and tens and tens of millions of years later, scientists called paleontologists dig up the fossil bones, clean them off, and try and stick them all back together again, like a giant jigsaw puzzle. And here we have Baryonyx, his bones back together again after 130 million years. So, are all the dinosaurs in the museum real fossils? Well, not quite. Often, perfect fiberglass copies are made of all the bones. Museums make more than one set at a time and actually trade dinosaur skeletons with each other. Sort of like trading videotapes. Sort of. What's that one called? That's Camarasaurus from the Jurassic period. He was found in the American state of Utah. Camar... Camarasaurus? That's it. What does it mean? Chambered lizard. Can you guess why? I don't know. Maybe he could sleep in his stomach. No, 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 no. You see, dinosaurs like Camarasaurus and our friend Diplodocus grew to such a size that nature had to design bones that were both strong and light at the same time. So why did... Professor? Professor? You see these bones? From Ornithopsis, relative of Camarasaurus, full of holes. Air weighs less than bone. Camera means room or chamber. So these bones are filled with rooms, chambers, holes, but in such a way as to make them light while the strength remains intact, like a honeycomb. Or an aero bar. I don't think I've tried one of those. Hey, whose arms are those? They could belong to the greatest carnivore of them all. Wow. Or not. They were found in Mongolia. He's named Dinochirus. The name means terrible hands. If I had hands like that, it would be pretty terrible. Was it a giant T-Rex? The shape of the arms indicates that it wasn't at all like Tyrannosaurus. 
This one set of arms is all we know about these beasts. They must have been massive. Probably. Or it could be a giant ostrich-like dinosaur with no teeth. There is still so much to learn. Like uh, Massospondylus here. It lived considerably earlier than the dinosaurs we've already seen. From the Triassic period. Well spotted. Actually, he's from the Jurassic period. But we won't split hairs over 10 million years or so. The small skull and the long neck both tell us something. Can you think of a dinosaur that you've already seen that has similar characteristics? Well, it wouldn't be Triceratops. I know, Diplodocus. Right. Masospondylus is a prosauropod, an early relative of later giant sauropods like Diplodocus. Its teeth suggest that it may have eaten both plants and animals. Like me, but my sister is a vegetarian. Creatures which eat both plants and animals are called omnivores. Those that eat plants only are herbivores. And those that eat meat are carnivores. Yes! Massospondylus, it means massive vertebrae. My god, how in the world did you know that? It says so in the sign here. <laughs> Hey, there's Allosaurus without his flesh on. Did you read that too? No, he looks like T-Rex, but he's not quite the right shape. Good. He can be distinguished from T-Rex by his more powerful arms. And it's three rather than two fingers. On each hand. Where else? Now, I want you to look especially above each of the beast's eyes. Notice the small bony points on the top of the head, just in front of each eye. Tyrannosaurus didn't have anything similar. But what use were they? I'm not quite sure. It, it may have had something to do with display or mating and all that. But is he as fierce as T-Rex? Given the choice, I would avoid them both. And speaking of things to avoid, here's another deadly predator, Albertosaurus. From Alberta in Canada? Correct. My uncle lives there. How interesting. Notice the arms, just like T-Rex, very short with only two fingers. Now, Albertosaurus belongs to the family called Tyrannosauridae, like T-Rex. Albertosaurus lived slightly earlier than T-Rex and was smaller and probably a bit faster. Sort of like a T-Rex sports model. You said it, not me. He looks fierce. In fact, he's a plant eater all the way from China. Wouldn't harm a flea. I suppose I should say just because he's a plant eater, it doesn't mean he's completely harmless, as I'm sure we will see. What's he called? To Yangosaurus, he belongs to a group of dinosaurs called Stegosaurs. Like all other Stegosaurs, he had two rows of plates running down his back. As we shall see, they served a number of possible purposes. To... to... To Yangosaurus. The name derives from the Chinese language. Dinosaurs come from everywhere. As I said, they were the dominant species on land for tens of millions of years. This one looks like a giant bird without any feathers. Actually, it's Gallimimus. It means chicken mimic. It belongs to a group of dinosaurs called Ornithomimids. Its long neck and slender but powerful hind legs give it the appearance of certain flightless birds, such as ostriches. Although related to the meat-eating dinosaurs, Gallimimus is interesting in that he had no teeth. Therefore, it's difficult to know exactly what it ate. Clearly, its hands were designed for grasping, but just what we do not know. Is there anything we do know? Well, they could certainly run very fast. I think you can see that for yourself. And their brains were quite large for a dinosaur, as were their eyes. I expect their vision must have been very well developed. Kentucky Fried Chicken will pay fortunes to get their hands on him. I beg your pardon? Nothing. Put on your glasses and take a look. Weird. This is what scientists think Gallimimus looked like when it was alive during the Cretaceous period in Mongolia.
Velociraptors, wow! Not quite. Those are Dromaeosaurus, running lizards, closely related to Velociraptors. They too hunted in packs. They don't look that big. Voracious hunters they were, even though the largest measured less than two meters in length. Yes, look, razor-sharp teeth, powerful muscular bodies, and on both hands and feet, the claws were perfectly designed for ripping flesh. Where did they live? Canada. It's lucky for your uncle that they're not prowling the prairies today. But why do so many dinosaurs in Canada or America? I suppose because more people look for them there. But this dinosaur is from Britain, the Isle of Wight, to be exact, Iguanodon lived 135 million years ago in Europe and North America. Uh, in fact, it was the first dinosaur ever to be found. It was near the beginning of the last century. The first dinosaur ever found. Surely someone must have come across dinosaurs long before that. Well, previously people discovered bits of bones and teeth, but thought they belonged to dragons or other imaginary beasts of myth and legend. But all that changed with Iguanodon. Who named it? Oh, a friend of mine, a scientist called Mantell. And who named dinosaurs dinosaurs? Oh, for that, in all modesty, I must take credit. Indeed, in my honor, a banquet was held inside an iguanodon. Uh, I have a picture. A banquet in an iguanodon? Yes, in 1854. Ah, it was a heady time. The champagne flowed. We were the very first to have actual scientific evidence of this great race of monsters which once dominated our planet. But that doesn't look at all like an iguana. It's too fat, it's on four legs. What's that horny bump on its nose? Oh, we were just learning. And that bump on its nose, well spotted. Actually, it's a spike that fits on the creature's hand where its thumb would be. Indeed, it's called a thumb spike. Wow. Look, it's great for attacking other dinosaurs. I think it's the other way around. Iguanodon was a plant eater. Allosaurus there probably did the attacking and received a pain in the neck for his troubles. So it was just for defense. Take this. Most excellent. A thumb spike. I wouldn't like to get caught by this. But he's so slow and stupid. I'll just run. Stupid? Oh, we'll talk about that later, but slow, they certainly were not. See this hook bone here? Giant muscles just like these would be attached to it. That's one big drumstick. <laughs> Dinosaurs fall into two major groups, bird-hipped and lizard-hipped. The pattern of the hip bones tell us which kind of dinosaur we are looking at. See here, in Iguanodon, the two bones near the center lie close together and both point away from the head. This means it's bird-hipped. It all has to do with the leg muscles and the way they are attached to the bones. Let me think, let me think. Aha, put on the magic glasses. What's that? That, my boy, is Parasaurolophus. Parasaurolophus. We can tell it's related to Iguanodon because its hip is the same shape. We use the term bird-hipped because... Birds have similar-shaped hips. Hey, there's Triceratops. Is he bird-hipped? Yes, well done. Notice he walks on all fours, but still, he's bird-hipped. Now, all bird-hipped dinosaurs were vegetarians, so Iguanodon, Parasaurolophus and Triceratops only ate plants. Which means... Another kind of dinosaur only eats meat. Good guess. Almost right. See Allosaurus? He's lizard-hipped. In other words... His hips. Not like a bird's, but a lizard's. Good! One hip bone points forward and the other backwards. So the Allosaurus eats meat, not plants. Excellent! But here's the rub. Our old friend Diplodocus there is also lizard-hipped, but eats only plants. All bird-hipped dinosaurs ate only plants, but some lizard-hipped dinosaurs ate plants, whilst others ate only meat. Diplodocus must have eaten mountains. 
But he doesn't look like he's got any teeth. Well spotted, lad. Actually, he does have teeth, but they're very weak. Mostly, he used them only for stripping the leaves off branches. Nearly a ton a day. A ton a day? So how does he chew? Oh, he doesn't. He swallows stones about the size of a hen's egg, which grind the food like millstones and flour. Oh, he's amazing. Look at all those fins. It's Stegosaurus. We'll, we'll talk about the fins later, but for now, he too is a herbivore. Which means he only ate plants. As you can see, he's built to graze near the ground. Like a cow? Yes, a funny cow. But some think that he could also prop himself up on his hind legs to eat leaves from trees. Could he eat apples or oranges? I'm sure he'd find them delicious, but during the Jurassic period, when both he and Diplodocus lived, flowering plants hadn't yet evolved. I'm afraid he had to make do with furs. And grass. Oh, well, grasses didn't appear until long after the end of the dinosaur's reign. Look, this Parasaurolophus. Did he have stones in his stomach too? Maybe, but he didn't really need them. He had row after row of the most smashing teeth, all used for chewing and mashing. He also had cheeks, very much like ours, for moving the food about so it would get chewed up more easily. Professor. Over here. Take a look at this. That's Parasaurolophus's head. It's enormous. I wanted to give you an idea of its true size. Imagine the sound of thousands and thousands of these gigantic trumpets going all at once. You see, it is now thought that animals like this were terribly common. For example, the Great Plains of North America must have been thick with them. The world must have been a really weird place. Maybe it's now that's weird. I never thought of it that way. Professor? Professor? Marvellous. Marvellous. What is it? It's a real gizzard stone. You mean that was in the stomach of a dinosaur? 130 million years ago. How do you...? No, it's a gizzard stone, because I found it digging the fossils of a dinosaur. Could I find one? Oh, perhaps. But you'd have to find a dinosaur to be certain. So you helped a real dinosaur chew its food? So did these. These are from Trachodon, not dissimilar to the Parasaurolophus we just saw. Notice the chisel shapes. Good for chomping through all those tough, fibrous leaves. But what are those layers? You had just one set of teeth which fell out and were replaced by others. But this dinosaur was constantly losing teeth, and throughout its whole life, new teeth grew up to replace them. And here they are. I wonder what his dentist thought. What do you think this is? That's a tooth. I don't think it's for eating leaves. Quite right. It's for tearing flesh. It's got sharp little bumpy bits like a knife. They're called serrations. And see, the tooth is curved better to grip the flesh of its prey. In case it tries to run away. Mm. What a beautiful mouthful of teeth backed by powerful jaws. Tyrannosaurus rex. What a beast. Can we see him for real? Of course. Now, what have you done with your glasses? Is it the biggest dinosaur of them all? Not the biggest dinosaur, but the biggest meat eater. Do you know what Tyrannosaurus rex means? Well, rex is king. Taurus is lizard or reptile. Tyranno means tyrant or fierce. So king of the tyrant lizards. Tyrannosaurus is so fierce, why is his hand so small? You're right. In fact, they are so small they can't even reach his own mouth. Some people think he wasn't the great hunter he is made out to be, but a more humble scavenger. Well, what do you think? I like to think of T-Rex as king of the dinosaurs.
king of the dinosaurs. But they could beat them all. Maybe not. Many dinosaurs, like Triceratops there, evolved brilliant defenses. Just look at those horns. I'm sure T-Rex wouldn't enjoy running into them, especially if they were backed by massive weight and a rhino-like charge. What about all the bone on the back of his head? The neck frill. It served two purposes. It anchored massive jaw muscles, and just as importantly, it provided armoured protection for the neck. That Stegosaurus again. Surely T-Rex would have no trouble with him. Actually, Stegosaurus lived earlier and had to deal with meat-eaters like Allosaurus. Did you notice those big sharp spikes on its tail? Oh, yeah. It could deliver a volley of flesh-tearing blows against any opponent. What about all those bony things on his back? Do they help protect him? Oh, the plates, you mean? Probably not. The best thinking suggests that they were used to regulate its body temperature. If it wanted to warm up, it could turn sideways to allow more sun to fall upon the plates. We don't have to do that. Oh, that's because we are warm-blooded and have internal heat controls. Scientists are still arguing as to whether dinosaurs were hot or cold-blooded. We haven't seen him before. That's you, Oplicephalus. Look at that tail. Correct. The tail could attack like his cannon. The spikes were his armor. Even his eyelids were defended. Does it remind you of anything from your time? A tank. Exactly. Only its belly was vulnerable, but close to the ground and dangerous to reach. So nothing's new in 150 million years. Look here, this is a horn from Triceratops. The bony beds were covered with this lethal layer of sharp horn. It's sharp. Yes. As far as the Tyrannosaur is concerned, lunch could fight back rather fiercely. This is a very interesting picture. We know it's accurate because the fossils were actually found in this position. Protoceratops seems to be getting the best of your friend, the Velociraptor. I guess your plant eaters were less wimpy than I thought. Uh, here, take this. What is it? It's a scoot. Not only did the dinosaurs have backbones, they had bones in their backs. Quite difficult for even the fiercest predator to bite into that. Here you see Scylidosaurus strolling through the English countryside. English? Oh, about 200 million years ago. And the predator is thinking twice about attempting a snack. Can you guess what this is? It can't be a tail club. It's too heavy. Aha, uh -huh, but it is. Which just goes to show the immense power of those beasts. The muscles in their tails must have been enormous. You Oplocephalus again. A single blow from that giant mallet-like tail could easily break the leg of any attacking Tyrannosaur. Are there any animals today with hammer-like tails? Many animals use their tails for defence, but nothing as devastating as this. And if an attacker managed to get past the tail, there were all those scoots to contend with. The poor old Tyrannosaur always seems to come up second best. It's amazing he ever ate lunch. Of course. The predators won their share, too. Wow, that's Tyrannosaurus. No, it must be Allosaurus. It's too small and its arms are too big. It's attacking the Plodocus. Good, well remembered. Look at poor the Plodocus's face. Doesn't seem to have any defenses at all. Ah, but it does. Certainly its size protects it, just like elephants today. And that whip-like tail. I doubt that Allosaurus would appreciate a lashing from that. But look there. 
in the background, it's quite possible that Diplodocus travelled in herds. Just like we were the beast. Quite so. Imagine a herd of Diplodocus thundering across the plain. Do you know what this is? Yuck. It's skin. Very occasionally, bits of skin would turn into a fossil. Go on, touch it. It's bumpy and bony and rough. Yeah. It's off the chest and arm of a creature called Edmontosaurus. Tough as crocodile skin, wouldn't you say? Durable, flexible, with small bony bits embedded in the surface. I expect it offered excellent protection. Was this its real colour? Oh, unlikely. Nobody knows the real colours. But like lizards today, they must have been every colour under the sun. Good for camouflage and all that. But there's so many pictures of dinosaurs. How were they made? A ah, bit of speculation and rather a lot of imagination, I suspect. Look here, a Tenontosaurus. The artist's idea is to base the colour scheme on the reptiles living today. And Bryosaurus, another plant eater from the Upper Jurassic and Lower Cretaceous. There are many, many snakes and other reptiles blessed with a similar earthy brown tint. And Hypsilophodon. She's coloured a bit like an iguana, and green and bumpy. Yes, I think you've got the point. Now, shut your eyes and we'll move on. Here's the skeleton of Hypsilophodon. It had yet another defence against predators. Looks like he's built for speed. Quite correct. Its defence was running away. Look at the long legs. Big strides, powerful muscles. And that stiff tail. It would have helped with its balance and making very sharp turns at full tilt. Could any of the meat eaters run as fast? Professor? Professor? Where in the world? Oh, yeah, shut my eyes. Fantastic, aren't they? It's a pack of Deinonychus attacking and feasting upon a Tenontosaurus, a plant eater, which may have strayed from its hermit. Those Denon... Den... Deinonychus. Deinonychus? Are they like Velociraptors? Very closely related. Deinonychus means terrible claw. You can see why. It's thought that they left on their prey and slashed them to death. Do you think they organise their attacks? Like wolves or lions? Well, oh, nobody knows. Personally, I think organisation was beyond them. But if I saw them coming, I would give them a very wide berth. Unfortunately for the Tenontosaurus, it didn't. This Tenontosaurus looks different from the one we saw before. Remember, my boy, about colour, imagination and informed speculation, but the claws were very much for real. Look at the wicked bend in his toe. Yes, the claw swivelled to give a more powerful cut and retracted for walking and running. They're eating it alive. Hyenas and hunting dogs also eat their prey alive. Yuck. Formidable. You like them? They were formidable. Dinosaurs were really stupid, weren't they? It was as if they hardly had any brain at all. Oh, dear boy, you are so mammalocentric. What? You think your big mammal brain is everything. Well, when it comes to brains, size isn't everything. Time to put on the glasses. There's Stegosaurus. It had two brains, didn't it? Another common mistake. Like you and I, its brain was in its head. 
Some people used to think it had a second brain by its hip, but that was just a mass of nerves to control its hind quarters. You mean it was so large it needed a relay station to get messages from one end to the other? Yes. Now, Diplodocus had a very tiny brain for its body size, but still, it was a very successful animal. You don't need a big brain to be interesting. Parasaurolophus and its relatives are plant eaters, known as duckbills, but their most prominent feature was a crest. Once people thought it was a snorkel for underwater breathing. Unlikely. Perhaps it attracted mates or frightened off predators. Personally, I think it was used as a low-frequency horn, like a trombone, used to warn others. The low-frequency sound could penetrate without giving away the animal's whereabouts. What about the carnivores? How smart were they? Our experience with mammals suggests that predators usually are just a bit smarter than prey. So maybe Allosaurus was a touch faster in the brain than the Plodocus. Most dinosaurs had brains comparable in size to modern-day reptiles, like, say, crocodiles. But the biggest brains belong to the small hunters, like Truodon here. Its brain was similar in size to that of a modern-day bird of the same mass. So, in the dinosaur world, bird-brained means bright. I've told you. Brain size isn't everything. Now consider the gorilla. Its brain is massively bigger than any dinosaurs, yet it faces extinction. And cockroaches, with almost no brain at all, lived before the dinosaurs and will very probably outlast us. I'll remember that next time, Professor, when I fail a mass test. <laughs> Professor? Oh boy, here we go again. Dinosaurs laid eggs, like birds and reptiles today. But I bet they left their young to fend for themselves. Not at all. Indications are that these Myosauri had very caring parents. Nests were elaborate and well-constructed. Look here. Either one or perhaps both parents would bring food for the young. Ah, look at that baby waiting for its supper. What is it they're eating? Ferns. Ferns? What's that? It's not a dinosaur. Correct. It looks like a nest robber. And successful, too. Myosauri themselves were quite successful. They were relatives of Parasaurolophus and found in great numbers. They must have had some sort of homing instinct because they returned to the same sites every nesting season. How old were the young when they left their nest? I don't really know, but probably when their legs were strong enough to run on. Here's another picture showing parental care. Our old friends, the Tyrannosaurs, are attacking a group of Centrosaurus. They look like Triceratops. Very similar, but one horn only. Look at the little baby there. His horn hasn't developed yet, which means he is totally dependent upon his parents for safety. In the meantime, he represents a succulent hors d'oeuvre for a hungry Tyrannosaur. Notice how the plant-eating Centrosaurus form a circle to protect the young ones. That must auction today. <laughs> Professor, he's done it again. I just had to show you this one. Coelophysis here lived 220 or 225 million years ago. 
City up the Triassic. Excellent. In New Mexico, in the United States. Well, it wasn't the United States then, but you know what I mean. Notice these sharp claws and teeth indicating... It's probably a carnival. Right. And what is interesting is what is found here, inside his ribcage, his last meal. Yes. Still preserved as fossils are the bones of a smaller coelophysis. So... He's a cannibal. It's difficult to draw any other conclusion. It seems like there's a dinosaur for every possibility. Dino Versita, I'd call it, Professor. Professor? Ah, so you're keeping up. Now, you asked how long an individual dinosaur would live. I did. I'm sure you were about to. This, my boy, is part of the leg of an iguanodon. See here, signs of arthritis. Oh, excuse me. So much crouching is rather difficult at my age. <laughs> As they grew older, dinosaurs, like the owner of this leg, suffered much the same types of disease as some humans do today. How long did dinosaurs live, and how do we know? Rings. Rings appear when a dinosaur is partly grown. Like tree rings? Yes, but we don't know if they appeared yearly. However, we can count them to give estimates of dinosaur lifetimes which range anywhere from 15 to 50 years or more. Generally, the larger they were, the longer they lived. If they managed to survive into old age. Professor? Professor? You've heard of people with thick skulls, but this has to take the biscuit up to 25 centimetres of nothing but solid bone. 25 centimetres? Why? Well, like mountain goats, Pachycephalosaurus crashed their heads together in competition for mates. Look. So the thickest bone protected their tiny brains? No, no. Remember, size doesn't count. Although, in fact, their brains were small, about the size of a tennis ball. But the ritual indicates a measure of social organisation. Like a pecking order, with the thickest headbanger on top. That's an interesting way of putting it. If dinosaurs were so terrific, what happened? How comes they all died out? Well, as I've said, dinosaurs were amongst the most successful animals ever to occupy the land. This must have been a familiar scene at the end of the Cretaceous period. So this is how our world once looked. About 70 million years ago, this was a normal, everyday sight. Every day? For millions and millions of years. Just a group of herbivores coming for a drink and a bath. Look who's lurking in the background. Tyrannosaurus. Even today, carnivores like lions will watch the herbivores at the waterhole. Except for our imaginations, this is a time and a world lost forever. Except for fossils. Indeed, dinosaur fossils are found in rock right up to the end of the Cretaceous, but none after. So dinosaurs must have disappeared quickly. Well, in geological time, yes, very quickly. But they were already in decline. What happened? Well, put on your glasses and we'll see if we can find out. Mammals, such as Megazostrodon here, were around at the same time as the dinosaurs, but they were tiny and relatively insignificant. It was once believed that these little mammals ate all the dinosaurs' eggs, which, of course, would eventually lead to their extinction. But that's ridiculous, isn't it? I'm afraid so. Another discredited theory suggests that the increased sunlight turned all the dinosaurs blind, so they fell off cliffs or bumped into trees. So what really happened? There are two main theories. Either could be right, or perhaps a combination of both. The first is that a large object from outer space, perhaps a comet or meteor, smashed into the Earth. So much dust, gas and debris filled the atmosphere that light from the sun became blocked. Plants died. The herbivores had nothing to eat, and as they died off, the carnivores starved. The 
second theory also depends on sunlight being blocked out, this time from a series of gigantic volcanic eruptions. The volcanoes threw out millions of tons of dust and gas into the atmosphere. Again, once the food chain was broken, neither herbivore nor carnivore could survive. It's really sad. I like dinosaurs, and they vanish from no fault of their own. Now, no one will ever see one again. Maybe all is not lost. Put on those glasses. Remember Pteranodon, a reptile that flew around at the same time as dinosaurs? He was not the only creature flying in those ancient skies. This is Archaeopteryx believed to be the earliest known bird. We know it's a bird because its fossils tell us it had feathers, but its skeleton is extremely similar to that of a small flesh-eating dinosaur. Birds are descended from dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are with us right now. Professor? Professor? Where are you? Professor! invented the name dinosaur. Kerry? Kerry? What was the name of the man who invented the name dinosaur? Professor Sir Richard Owen. He once had dinner in Aguanodon, and they thought that the thumb spike fit on his nose. Kerry, have you been sitting outside without your hat on? I don't think so. <laughs> OK, class, come on, this way. It is real dinosaur. It is real dinosaur. It is. It isn't a real dinosaur. 
Is it Look at it. Look at it closely. It, 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 it isn't a real one. It is real. It is a real one. Shh. Here we go.